Welcome back to Seeker Strength. Welcome back to Seeker Stan. Welcome back to the Seeker Stan new show. Today, the new show is, of course, brought to you by the Seeker Strength app. Maybe you need a bigger bench press. Head over to the Seeker Strength app and run the Seeker Bench program. Maybe you've got weak legs. Head over to the Seeker Strength app and run the Rotating or Part 1 or Part 2 squat program. Now, starting off the new show, the weightlifting section, as always, we have got a throwback to some massive lifts. Throwback starting off. So there's a quick special update for the broadcast. Literally, literally breaking news. Literally at time of press. We were editing. <laughs> I was editing the new show, swiping through Instagram, waiting for a massive video file. 30 gigs to render and transfer over to my laptop. And as I was swiping through this little glimpse of Ilya, so Ilya put up this video, 247 kilo clean and jerk attempt, one kilo over his best clean and jerk. This is the same session we cleaned 250. This 247 misses the jerk. What an attempt though. Holy moly. What a clean. The clean is so good. He I, is the king of cleans. My God, I actually can't. Oh. I can't think of any clean that's looked that good ever. This this is, I can't even. This oh. is big time money session. He's wearing the singlet. The singlet. He's fully, fully primed for this session. Runs up to the bar in typical Ilya fashion. Absolutely rips it off the ground. There will never be another. No, no, we're looking at the goat right here. Now, what I love here is he missed the jerk, has the little moment of annoyance, and then puts up the finger as like, do not unload that bear. I am going to hit that again. This is definitely putting up in response to Moretti, or at least in the thought process. So there's a caption with it. It says, 247, one time on my life. My things, my things, that was my favorite clean in my life. How do your things, friends, missing for victories? Oh, don't lament, Lilia. You've this is, whatever it being his favourite clean of his life, it's my favourite <laughs> clean of his life. No, the 250 is better because the 250 is heavier and it's basically the same thing. <laughs> Incredible. 247. We'll never see another Ilya. We could not include this. I don't think, unless technology changes drastically or the culture of the world changes, there won't be another time where someone can do what Ilya did for so long. It just won't no. happen. I think it's gone now, probably. I think that was just a... A, like a, a confluence of events, just a, a aligning of the spheres. That was a building of a beautiful cre crescendo mm. that ended in a, a career being cut too short. Crazy breaking news there. Okay, 247. Holy moly. Holy moly. You know what? Actually, one thing. I know for a fact Ilya's best video is still unpublished and he's snatched from the floor. He's heaviest ever snatched from the floor. He's unpublished. So, you know what, everyone? The power of the new show. Comment on this video. And say, Ilya, post. Get that snatch. Just say, post your best snatch. Surely he'll post it. If 10, 20, 40, 50 of you post it in the comments, surely he'll post the video. We need it. I need it. I the have world to needs see it. to see it. I need, I need to see it. For the good of my own mental health, I need to see that video. With arguably one of the greatest weightlifters ever, who we didn't quite get to see his full potential in competition. Or I feel like he, while he did, of course, set records, he never really set the ones we knew he was capable of. So Rab Moretti put up this 200 kilo snatch in training. Now, this was during a period when he was in 96 or 94. Now, he's probably in the 100 kilos body weight here, realistically. Uh, it's very often you see those 94s. Like we saw Ilya, he was training in the, like, the, the mid-100s when he was a 94. Still, still though, this 200 kilo snatch is ridiculous. By a double body weight in competition competitor, 200 kilos. What? It's absolutely gorgeous looking as well. That's too so good. I think this is as good as we've seen his snatch looking. Like we don't see any kind of technical misnomers. We also don't see it being massively hip smashy, which some of his heavier snatches are. Well, I think the hip, the hip smash came on with the shoulder issue. Yes, which would kind of make sense as well that he's, he'd need to kind of allow for that. Yeah, like his snatch and clean and jerk were obviously heavily deteriorated when he dislocated his shoulder from training too heavy, from what the Iranian team said, and he had a very unsuccessful rehab process, unfortunately. But up until that point, I think all of his lifts were super consistent. 200 kilos from a, a 96 kilo lifter. It's crazy how textbook the form is. Or in fact, yeah, sorry, 94 kilo competitor. Yeah, it's, he's just... It's just bloody gorgeous. It's 200 kilos as a 94 in camp. It's uh, yeah. done in the worst way lifting shoes in the world, and like trees, you know, ram trees. <laughs> The worst weightlifting shoes, but probably the most anabolic training room ever. Oh, yeah. 
This is, of course, by Vintage Lifts. So he captured this from Sorab Marathi's brother who put it up on his Instagram story. Now, on top of that, this one is the most submitted or the most tagged or the most DM'd lift we've had in the history of the new show. Within the first hour, we were sent this by eight different subscribers or followers of Seeker Strength on Instagram. And it is absolutely phenomenal. So this is Sorab's 243 kilo clean and jerk. This is around the same time when he was 94. And of course, this is uh, well pre before that shoulder rehab. This is the heaviest clean and jerk we've ever seen from Sorab. So we've seen a 205 kilo snatch from Sorab. I think it was in that same session as the 200. But this is by far the heaviest clean and jerk. We've seen some 240s and 235s very routinely. But uh, we haven't seen heavier than this 243 which is incredible. The crazy thing about this clean in particular is how difficult the clean seems to be. Mm -hmm. Like the standing up from the clean seems to be very difficult, which would lead you to believe the jerk is going to look non-ideal. Now, I know he kind of walked it around a small bit. It's a bit of rotation, but by God, that's a great looking jerk. So if we compare him to Ilya, Ilya has said he's on like 203 from the floor, I believe, when he was a 105. We know he's clean and jerk 245 and clean and, well, 246 in comp, which is best ever clean and jerk, which is crazy. Clean and squat jerk 245. And Sorab has done that 205 and then clean and jerk this, possibly this 243 is his biggest jerk. I'd imagine it probably is at this stage, surely would have seen more. But two of the, the greatest lifters that ever graced the platform. I think one of the unique things is a lot of weightlifters. It tends to be the pathway for a phenomenal weightlifter that they'll get a lifetime ban and then we stop seeing them lift. Mm -hmm. In this case, we were kind of robbed of his best years due to injury. It's yeah. quite strange or quite different from most people. I, I'd have to wonder, could that rehab process have gone better if he had uh, gotten some better advice? So he went to Germany for the surgery and apparently the surgery went pretty well by all accounts. But as many people know, when you're trying to get back to sport in the highest level, the surgery going well is just the first part and the an efficient and smart rehab is the next big steps. And look at the stuff he was doing, I'm not sure. It obviously didn't go very well. Maybe it was just too much to expect that he'd ever get back to those big weights with the same range of motion. But you'd have to wonder in this current day and age, you know, and especially with all the peptides and healing factors available to him, you'd have to wonder, could it have gone better? I think it's a kind of a big unknown. Yeah, I think one of the other things is rehab therapy generally in the Western world has progressed massively mm -hmm. in the last even 10 or 15 years. And that is one area where the sharing of information when you're in a kind of closed off country like Iran, the sharing of information or not sharing of information really works against you. Uh, you have to imagine that if it was in the US or in Europe somewhere, maybe you have a small bit more access to some of the more modern techniques or just even access to some different ideas that might be more beneficial to you in one case rather than the kind of standard one they've been doing for the last 50 years. Yeah, and before anyone thinks we're talking schmack in Iran, we've been to Iran, uh, it's an amazing country, lovely people, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's maybe just a big unknown that we'll never be able to get an answer to. He tried his best to come back, but we just never really saw, of course, the same level lifting. Like, his power was there. Like, he'd clean things. He'd be cleaning 220 like nothing. Mm. But the jerk was just never an option. Now, we're also blessed with another throwback. Not sure when exactly this was. I don't think it's recently, but it's from Archim Okulov. So, Archim is, of course, the hang snatch king. Here is a snatch at 180 kilos plus hang snatch competes or used to compete as an 85 obviously we haven't seen him on the international stage in a long time we've seen him do a hang snatch and snatch with a 180 kilos before we've seen him hang snatch 190 as an 85 which was three kilos over the world record in the 85s two kilos over the world record in the 94s at the time but this 180 is so crisp so clean it's the bringing it down, so just after catching the first snatch mm. and then bringing it down to that hang, obviously he's a hang snatch king. He's going to be good at cycling through those reps. But how nonchalant he brings that back down into his hip, like it's an empty bar. It looks like he's warming up with it. It is so, so good. This pull under and the heavy snatch is incredible. It's uh, The extension is so... It looks so short, but obviously it's more than adequate. But the, the, yeah, the just the pull under, the lockout and the lift, the precision... The 
the numbers Archon was putting up, he'd snatched 180 as an 18 year old, 85, or was he 17? Which was one of the craziest lifts. I remember when it came out at the time on, on YouTube on some random channel. Uh, he was a, uh, you know, he's been hitting these numbers for 12 years now, basically. <laughs> Archim is the kind of epitome of what a fully muscled out weightlifting athlete looks like yeah. in their correct weight class. You know, obviously, we've got a lot of really good competitors now who are in phenomenal shape. A lot of the Chinese team are in crazy shape. But you have to feel like Archim is kind of the epitome of what weightlifting physique looks like in an elite athlete. He's very, very muscular, obviously in the lower body, massive quads, massive hips, but his upper body is so well developed as well. The, the thing about these lifts has made me think, and it's something that I didn't really notice until I kind of saw these two lifts, is that the general trend for top weightlifting performance is going down uh, year after year from the last kind of peaked around... I'm going to say around 2016, we saw some of the kind of the biggest training lifts or rather it was continuing along that same level. You know, we think like Nija Ratmoff put out those like 180, 220 or something after Rio. He did that 214 as a 77. In the last couple of years, you know, we've seen a very aggressive fall off in the competition performance, except for Lash, of course. Lash is anomaly. It doesn't really make a spectrum. It is uh, an outlier. is isn't making a spectrum. You know, he's dragging that, that performance out, but he's really dragging it up in by himself. You know, the rest of lifting, while we still have great lifters, we haven't this same caliber of, for want of a better word, out of out of competition lifts, you know, the, the big lifts in training. Uh, you know, we did the 85 kilo class from 2014, and the amount of highly competitive athletes in the 85 kilo class was massive you know and the talk at the time look obviously it's drug related to a certain extent not of maybe it's participant related and system related too but part of it is the current drug culture or lack mm. thereof or less of or whatever you want to call it but whatever you want to say it unfortunately does make the sports somewhat less exciting less entertaining uh, when you have less top class athletes, it's a no brainer. It may not be correct or may not be right, but it is the reality of sport. Um, you know, there's certain members of a certain country in Europe who aren't the best lifters, but who get a lot of media time. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. They, as individual athletes, can do what they need to do and want to do, and there's no problem with them doing that but it's a similar thing same people who'd be saying that it's fine for them to do that and then if you look at the doping side of things what is popular in reality with people doesn't always necessarily line up with what you might consider right or what you might with the rules uh, it's certainly an interesting observation having been around wasting for quite a while it is it's harder to make a sport kind of not entertaining but it's harder to captivate people with a sport when Videos like this would have gotten a hundred thousand views on YouTube, yeah. you know, like a single lift video, which would be unheard of, you know, which is interesting. So there's a bigger demand than ever for weightlifting, but I'd fear there's not as much to fill it currently. I really think what you need for good success, people watching competitive weightlifting and people who aren't training in weightlifting, watching it and being interested in the actual international camps is a lot of superstars like mm -hmm. that 85 kilo class probably had 10 world-class superstars in it. Yeah. I feel like now, if you had a class at an international level competition with one or maybe two of that caliber of athlete, you'd be really excited. You'd be like, oh, I'm definitely going to watch the 102s or whatever it is because these people, these guys and girls are lifting in them. Um, whereas back then you'd have 10 superstars and everybody's watching it because you really don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, like I feel like the group of superstars is just getting smaller. You know, you could pick any class maybe from like kind of around 2011 plus or minus a few years and you would you could have at least four or five very high level athletes whereas now it's growing smaller so again that's not a limitation or a derogatory statement on any of the current athletes it's just more of an observation from being in spo involved in the sport for quite a while obviously we love weightlifting so it would be a shame not to enjoy weightlifting or, and hope it does well next up we've got Cape Vibert with a 125 kilo low block power clean and this is when you talk about modern day superstars, one of the superstars currently. Mm -hmm. And obviously very, very competitive Team USA at the moment. A lot of great athletes rising up through the ranks. Obviously, Kate has been here for a number of years competing internationally, doing very well, getting medals at major competitions. And this power clean is absolutely unreal. 
Yeah, so unfortunately it looks like she might not make the Olympics unless she makes a, I suppose, bigger improvement in performance. So Olivia Reeves is, I think, three or four years younger and has a couple of kilos on each of those lifts in competition done. So it's kind of looking like Kate might not make another Olympics, which is crazy. It's obviously a testament to how competitive those weight classes are in the USA. Yeah. One thing, looking at this video here, is you wonder, was there going to be a jerk afterwards? Mm. Or is that just a jerk dip? Or was she kind of feeling the way through it? Maybe she's plans to jerk that in a week or two in this current training cycle. And it's just to kind of feel your way through the weight, see what that whip feels like. Or was it a Clark for a jerk? I think the interesting thing about this is it's, I don't think that was a Clark for a jerk, but I think it was more of a, just a, just to see how it feels. Mm. Uh, my body's very much enjoying the week 3D low, thank God. So it's very interesting you know, when you think about your training normally as an amateur and you kind of, you know, you have a week deload and you're fresh up again. When you have these Olympic three-year cycles currently and you're training through them, you know, you hit periods of training where you're so fatigued that one week simply will not cut it. Like, you need a full block of training to recover, but you still need to maintain performance for that block. So it's a it's a delicate balance trying to maintain it. Mm. Here's another throwback. Uh, when I was looking through the videos of Moradi, I found this video on my Instagram. It's a video of Ilya from the front, a 242 kilo video. I have no idea where this video came from. I can't remember. This is from, this is three years ago nearly. And if anyone wants to repost it or anything to your Instagram, feel free because it's not my video. I don't know who had it. I have no idea. I'm pretty sure who I got it from was a repost, but... While we're on the subject of superstars. Yeah, I think this video in particular, and particularly this different angle that we mightn't have seen it from before, calls into question the elbow lockout thing and uh, yes. how stringent they're being on, on the judging of it currently. The last two years, we've seen a massive upscaling of the elbow lockout or no lift due to any weakness in the elbows overhead. We've certainly seen lifts in very sim similar positions to this getting two red lights or getting three red lights and you getting no lifted because of it. This is undoubtedly one of the best lifts to have ever happened in the sport of weightlifting. This is mm. the Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier kind of level of sporting achievement that happens. And nowadays we're probably looking at a modern judging committee or group of judges giving this as a no lift which kind of is a shame uh, in my opinion anyway. I think we should have some leniency uh, or at least some clarity around those rules. The the thing with this lift is if they red lighted him, you have to imagine they would have been absolutely mobbed by a full <laughs> house full of Kazakh people who would have lynched those judges. So there was no way they were getting away with that. I think their suitcases at the airport might have been diverted, pulled into a little room. I think they might have been in the suitcases <laughs> diverted. <laughs> So next we've got this lifter, Front Rack Kid. So I've seen a couple of videos of him. Uh, he seems to be a very talented young lifter. Someone sent me some of his stuff ages ago. I know Clarence was talking about him. And I think he's really hungry, which young lifter gunning for some high performance, which is great. And he's squatting 201 kilos for sets of five here. And uh, I just really appreciate it. On the subject of... People getting after and trying to be the best weightlifters they can be and trying to become superstars. I think uh, he kind of strikes me as someone who's trying his best. I'm not sure what age he is, but I'm pretty sure he was a teenager this year. So I assume he's probably still one now. And uh, I just love the kind of the tenacity, piss and vinegar, as you might call it. This is undoubtedly my favorite uh, time to follow an athlete when they're in that kind of developmental career doesn't even have to be in the sport of weightlifting if you're looking at something like rugby if you're looking at sprinting or track and field generally when you see young athletes they tend to have that bit more fire that bit more piss and vinegar as Gurf was saying to get after it obviously there's a whole host of things have to happen before you have a successful international senior level career but this is the most exciting time to follow an athlete to see them progressing making these big jumps from week to week the squad itself is absolutely unbelievable we're big on upper back positions and upper back development for good effective high bar squatting and here you see upper back development in trumps yeah so here's actually 140 kilo snatch of him when he was 17 years old so that was 16 weeks ago so he's actually still basically mid-teens which is incredible so really definitely one to watch by the looks of things so really clean snatch big yeah, numbers very very sure, good pretty sure the last time i looked at him he was doing a 120 snatch so yeah 
Hopefully he's getting after it. And by the looks of it, he is. Here we've got an Estonian weightlifter. Mm, Eliza, I want to say, Eliza Peterson. She is squatting 130 kilos for a set of 10. And the first rep is pause. Of course, high bar, full depth. It's a weightlifting squat. Or as they used to call them back in the day in like those like York magazines and, you know, in, in like the 60s and 70s, the, the Olympic squat. The Olympic squat. The Olympic squat sounds so epic. It does, doesn't it? The big thing watching this set of squats, I just saw it earlier briefly, is how immaculate the squats are from rep to rep. Mm -hmm. Like we get it on a daily basis. People start the RTA or the RTA 2.0 and there's a lot of high volume squatting at the start. And we see the coaching videos that come into us when we're giving feedback and the degradation of form over those later reps, rep 7, 8, 9 and 10. It's rare that they look this good this late in the set obviously in this case Eliza is a, a professional athlete a full-time weightlifter and so you expect more from the elite level athletes but these look immaculately good I think there's some kind of like unilateral correlation between either your coach is super 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 jacked and you're really good or He's super fat and old. Like, yes. he's got a belly and you're going to be good. I think the more normal your coach looks in terms of, like, average health markers, you're probably less going to be, less likely to be performing very well. Yeah, you really want to be on either side of the bell curve where yeah. you're really massive, jacked and muscly, and that might be unhealthy, mm -hmm. or else you might be smoking 40 cigarettes a day yeah. and eating very poor food, and then that's definitely unhealthy. Whose bloods are worse is the question. <laughs> you know, that's the real question. The, yeah, you want to be, you know, when you're going to look for a coach, a lot of times people are like, oh, what do I look for in a coach? The healthier and less juicy or less like cigarette smoking they look, the less likely they are to be a good coach. I know, I know. It's, it's What you really want is the intersection of the two Venn diagrams where you know they're railing loads of PEDs. They have massive arms, but also have the kind of belly and the general body composition of somebody who's very unhealthy. I actually think... I think it's better if they had have railed PDs, no longer rail PDs, because oh, yeah. they, they perform so well, they just don't even care anymore. Like, they have no unfinished business, you know? Yes. Now they're just smoking cigarettes and drinking really, 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 really strong coffee. A really question, strong, really strong coffee. A question that I want to answer in my head mm -hmm. that I still haven't figured out is squatting or just generally weightlifting with hair that's that long and how it doesn't get in the way. Because everyone has seen the fail videos of like bar slipping down the back and a ponytail getting caught. Or obviously we had the rule change in weightlifting a few years ago now where the hair can touch the barbell. It used to be a no lift if your hair touched the barbell as you were pulling under or even on the jerk if your hair flew up and hit the bar. Uh, but some of the fails of back squats slipping down the back and the hair getting pulled down mm. are gruesome. I think the only way to answer is for you to grow out your hair and see. <laughs> now, next up, we've got Toshiki Yamamoto, who is doing a little bit of lifting again. So on his YouTube channel is a up to 80 kilo snatch, a little bit of training. And here is some Romanian deadlifts at 140 kilos. Toshiki, of course, had the operation on his leg. They put in titanium bar, was it? Mm, some yeah. kind of titanium bar. It hasn't healed great. <clears throat> it hasn't healed very well. I know he's still in a lot of pain. We went on a bit of a walk up to a temple with him and he was in a lot of pain. So that's kind of one of the reasons he hasn't been training as hard in terms of weight of thing, but I know he's making a little bit of comeback. Let's not call it a comeback. That's not fair. He's doing some weight of thing again, you know, so hopefully he can get back, even if he doesn't compete again to some, some weight lifting. Cause I, I got the impression he really loves it. This is, and I don't want to call it a comeback, but this is the comeback I want to see. Yeah. I want to see Tashiki snatching and clean and jerking. Comeback kind of makes it feel like, you know, you're kind of desperate for a go again, you know? Yes. Like, it's like Vinny Paz when he broke his neck and he's like, doctor, you don't know what kind of man I am. It's not that kind of comeback. <laughs> I just want to see him enjoy himself lifting, you know? Anyway, so let's say comeback is a wrong name for it. I think something to look at this video and maybe question or think about in your own head. A lot of time we get questions about people doing accessory work, particularly posterior chain accessories, stuff like this that is specifically meant to make your back stronger the romanian deadlift and wearing a belt so a lot of time people will say oh if i'm trying to really target my back or make my back stronger and the belt is facilitating my back 
and might take away some of the training effect. It's the same question we get about people doing leg hypertrophy work, so using the high bar back squat for better quad strength and wearing knee sleeves at the same time. For me personally, and I know Owen feels the same way, the use of these pieces of equipment, particularly to allow you to hit better positions for longer, to gain a bit more work capacity, to get a bit more high quality work done, I think is absolutely valid. And you probably should be looking at it, particularly in Tashiki's case. Tashiki has had massive squats, massive deadlifts, an incredibly strong athlete for his entire career. The use of a belt here isn't really going to take away any of that training effect. Here we've got another old G or old school lifter, Oleg Chen. So he, I think he's in Canada at the moment. So a former Russian made lifter, thinking 172 kilo jerk from the rack. Oleg used to be a 69 kilo weight lifter and then I think 73 for a little bit. What I really like about this jerk is just how pretty that overhead position is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That looks like you are teaching somebody how to do a split jerk and this is how it looks when you finish it. There's nothing crazy here. There's no really fast dip and drive, no crazy expression of power. Not that he's not a very strong and powerful individual, but just how crisp the positions are are absolutely perfect. You could take pictures of this, put them in one of those really nice hook grip uh, sequences of the lift and have a pretty much perfect technical model for the split jerk. It's very, very aspirational for most of us who want to get better split jerk. And he said, not bad. Not bad is right, Oleg. <laughs> not bad is right. So next, we have got Smeov Official, who I'm pretty sure is some kind of arm wrestler, doing a 100 kilo weighted pull-ups for a set of 10 at a body weight of 130 kilos. These start off with Andrei Smeov's. They start off very nice. They The reps are super clean at the start. This doesn't make sense. No, crazy. This Doing pull-ups at 130 kilos is so utterly difficult. Then that becomes 230 kilos, and then he does 10 pull-ups in a row. What You know what's mad about this is these are so heavy that warming up for them is just fatiguing. Because at some stage, weight acetic static stuff, if you're doing warm-ups, is way more fatiguing than warm-up for other lifts. You know, the, it's such a drastic fatigue curve. And uh, mm. warming up for this for a set of 10, how long must he been training for that? I always like a t-shirt with your name on the back, but there's only one thing better, and that's a t-shirt with your name on the back and the lab, the lab that sponsors you underneath it. Whoa, why did you say that? <laughs> oh, it literally says GSS Lab. Yeah. That could be just be a really edgy supplement company there. That might not be a hormonal replacement. Yes. There's a lot of athletes sponsored, <laughs> non-tested athletes, of course, by online telemedicine recently. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it. No, it's like race car drivers getting sponsored by tire companies. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's like... Yeah, or fuel companies or, you know, like it's fat snowboard companies getting sponsored by snowboards. You know, what's the big deal? You know, it's just fueling performance. No complaints here, own. Online telemedicine. If any online telemedicine wants to sponsor the Seek Straight News show, <laughs> feel free to let us know. Here we have got Krista Turvo. Kind of sounds like Krista Turbo, which I feel like she deserves this, is a hammer thrower. She, 180 kilo squat. In a great gym. This is where I want to see big throwers training. Just yep. inside of a track. Missed 180 kilos in the first attempt. Said, fuck that. Came back and nailed it. 180 kilos. An absolute horse. A ball of muscle. You know, failing maximal squats is so fatiguing. Mm-hmm. It is. Particularly in the way she failed out there. It's not like she sat down and bailed the bar at the bottom and never really tried. Like there was a very, very concerted effort to drive up against that and then her spotters helped her bring that back to the rack to then go and take maybe five or ten minutes of rest and hit that again afterwards is so so impressive obviously the weights here are astronomical they're crazy crazy weights Mm -hmm. for obviously throwers always make fools of weights but for a female thrower to be doing absolutely incredibly impressive but it's for me it's basically doing a double with it makes it way more impressive again you know Outside of, like, if you take away powerlifters, and we don't really see a lot of powerlifters doing, like, high bar full squats on the female side of things, just for whatever reason, we don't see much. We don't see much in the male side either, to be honest, in terms of, like, big lifts. Uh, we see it as assistance work, but we don't get to see their full potential. When it comes to, like, weightlifters, the next kind of strength sport who would have the biggest high bar squats really outside of a few freaks in the super heavies you know tatiana 
and we had Parky Young who were crazy outliers. It doesn't look like Krista is a super, you know. So this is pretty in line with so that some of the best of the best would also be squatting high bar, you know. Yeah. In terms of the female, maybe she's eighty odd kilos, maybe a little bit more. It's kind of hard to see. Maybe I could be totally missing the mark with that judgment of weight there, but. If I'm right, I think she's pretty close to being as good as you'll get most female weightlifters to be in that regard, who are top of weightlifting classes. Yeah, and I've heard the argument being thrown around that, oh, well, throwing is their sport and that back squatting is just an accessory and that weightlifting in the same way where snatch and clean and jerk is your sport, but back squatting is an accessory. You're still looking at the weightlifters being far more specifically trained to be better at squatting. Mm -hmm. They're probably squatting more often. They're certainly squatting with more emphasis on that having more of a an input into their final results it is it's crazy impressive what i like here is that the coaches or spotters didn't touch the bar until she needed a spot yeah just i hate the little two fingies on the bar you, I yeah you hate the, it. the input on it just let it go <laughs> just stop so here we have got a gentleman tyler scott obringer which is a very powerful sounding name is a strongman, as you can gather, doing 507 pounds, which is 230 kilos behind the neck push press. It's not a push track. There is no rebend of those knees. No. First time trying this. This is first time trying this. 230 kilos. So if Tyler Scott put up this video mm -hmm. and said, training for 10 years to hit this, yeah, it's still new show worthy. That would it's, be more impressive. Yeah. But this, where it's his first time trying the lift. Mm-hmm. What in the name of God is this man capable of doing? How many, there seems to be so many strong men out there at the moment who are doing big things. It seems to be growing more than ever. Like, I feel like 90s strong men is really big. Remember mm. we used to watch on TV at Christmas? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But there wasn't that many amateur strong men or like non-professional strong men. I don't even know how you went from being recreational strong men to professional. Like, yeah. Now it seems to be there is like the amount of strong men who are doing it and who are freaks. Is, uh, is bigger than ever, which is great to see. But just to see the pool for, like, professional strongman was world's strongest man, was those competitions in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And they used all flights to location on the same jet. Did they? Yeah, that was like a thing. They'd have a private jet, everyone would fly there, wherever they were going. In this case, it seems like there's hundreds of athletes, maybe not of this level, but of very, very serious international level competitors in strongman. It's great to see it growing so well. Also from Tyler Scott is a 200 kilo axel push press from the front. So I think it's fair to say, you know, he's done a lot of push pressing already. So it's not like he just went from no overhead stuff to straight to the 230 kilo behind the neck push press. But, you know, there's orders of magnitude where things are just crazy impressive, even if you've relatively trained and 230 is one of them. I think in terms of transfer or crossover, the training or the ability to do a behind the neck push jerk or behind the neck push press or behind the neck split jerk, it's going to be very favorable for the sport to strongman. It probably shows that your front rack position, you're not leaning back massively. You're not kind of going into that old Olympic style press. I much prefer that kind of super vertical torso that you see here. So Tyler is what we call in Ireland American tourist calves. So a lot of American tourists generally middle-aged men who do a lot of hiking come to Ireland to go hiking in some of the lovely scenery, usually on the west coast. Very often we'll have shorts and mahoose of calves, like the biggest pair of calves you've ever seen. Uh, some slang would be American tourist calves and everyone knows what that means when you say it in Ireland. And <laughs> Tyler has got American tourist calves. Tyler's got bigger calves than I have quads. That's not hard. <laughs> Here we have got Grip and Rip USA, Kurt Jensen, some of the freakiest athletes ever, along with Joe um, Kovac, oh, what's his name, Joe Kovac, another freak, benching, Kurt is benching 496 pounds, which is 225 kilos for 4.6 reps or four reps in an attempted <laughs> five. No, if you want to see freakish, go and follow Grip and Rip underscore USA on Instagram. Yeah. You will get pretty much daily updates of crazy weights like this being thrown around. No matter what he does, it seems to be insanely impressive. Mm -hmm. You never see something you're like, oh, those weights are kind of attainable for normal people. Never. They never are. A lot of it is training in a shed at home. Uh, it is so, so good. Definitely go and follow him. What I love is 
someone goes, not one good rep, obviously, because his hips come off the bench. And, and Cart, of course, replied with, uh, show me your good ones at 500 so I can learn what to do. Please spice them in with your 70 kilo shot, but throws too, 70 foot, so I can learn that too. So the thing is, obviously, if you're a powerlifter and your hips are coming off the bench, it's really bad because you're reinforcing lifts that don't follow the rules of federations. I don't know any federation that allows the hips to come off the bench. So practicing any rep with that is reinforcing bad habits, undeniable. But when it comes to athletes, specifically throwers as well, when their hips come off the bench, it really does not matter. Does it predispose you to risk of a random injury, an acute injury of something being so far outside of what your soft tissue can tolerate? Possibly. But realistically, if you can get to 500 pounds or near enough 500 pounds for a couple of reps, all that soft tissue is probably and those joints are exposed and that kinesthetic awareness is exposed to that awareness. So you're really probably not going to be going crazy. Is he still getting benefits out of that? Absolutely. Is he possibly getting more benefits out of it because the barbell is moving faster? Very possibly. Would we coach athletes to do that? No. But if someone comes to you benching 225 odd kilos for reps for a set of four, you're like, okay... Um, we've probably done enough benching now for throwing. That's probably what's going to happen there. And you'll maintain the bench, but you're not going to change it up drastically. I don't think there's any real concerns for this, but I'm glad I'm glad that comment, not one good rep, got zero likes. That makes me happy. What I really like as well is in the description of this video, he has put in that still hate bench press. <laughs> and it just gives you the idea that no matter how good you are at something or no matter how long you are on your your journey of progression through learning a lift and then getting better at it, there's still certain things you'll just hate. Mm. Whether it's benching, whether it's squatting, whether it's mobility work, whatever it is, there's still things that people just don't enjoy doing in training, but you still have to keep getting better at them. Like, put it in context, you know, if we had a 15-year-old shot putter, you'd be like, okay, we're going to keep hips in the bench, we're going to conform to standard rules. Most people lose a lot of tightness when their hips come off the bench. Most people don't gain any performance benefits when it comes to their bench when their hips come off. But if you have, if we had a young lifter, thrower shot putter hammer thrower whatever it is we'd have coach you would coach them hips on the bench keeping the lower body tight as possible keeping the body as rigid as possible and trying to get the most out of the bench press in the fashion that we're looking for but when someone like this you kind of just have to make some allowances for the freaks because there's no point what would he gain if he's not in pain from doing that you know if his throws are still going up you just kind of go okay don't break the glass urn yeah the really similar kind of gripe people have is when you see people doing that small double dip before you see throwers doing jerks or power jerks or anything like that and weightlifters oftentimes say oh you shouldn't be oscillating the bar in this case they're so strong and they've built that motor pattern over so long like Owen is talking about they probably get a bit more bar speed they probably get a bit more weight on the bar and it's not massively detrimental when they're already at that level yeah what you see in most people is if we try hips come off the bench or that hip drive What'll happen is the initial push off will be stronger, but then because you lose tightness, barbell speed slows down drastically, and then you don't end up finishing reps. You end up with a super grindy rep. But uh, no grinding here until the fail. Sticking with throwers, we have got Zach Landa with a 180 kilo power clean from the floor. People will look at this and, and say certain things. You might say, catch position is non-ideal, the hips are too far forward, and you're in a, a an artificially upright position that isn't correct. They might say the back is slightly bent as you're pulling the bar off the floor, maybe there's an overexposure to an injury happening there. But by God, I'm not going to say anything bad about this lift. No, it is 180 kilo power clean. It is super athletic as well. Big movements, moving fast, very, very aggressive. Is it Alabama State? I think it's Alaska State. Okay, okay, okay. You know, near Minnesota. <laughs> Alaska, Massachusetts. I don't know why Minnesota came to my brain there. <laughs> Zach Lander, 180 kilo power clean, big time lifting. Okay, here, Darrell, do you want to introduce this one? No, this, this was, is... This is Darrell's favourite submission to the new show. He was so excited to show me this one. This, this was metaphorically slapped on your desk this morning it when was, I walked in. It was. I absolutely love this. So a lot of the time people look at different sports. They'll say premiership soccer players, the best athletes in the world, college or NFL level football players, best athletes in the world, NBA players, most athletic people in the world. This gives you an insight into how freaky the freaks are. 
They're running against track and field athletes, so uh, trained runners, trained sprinters, I assume in this case. I'm not quite sure who they're running against, but it certainly looks like people who are training to run. And then you have, is it offensive linemen in this case? You have a number of lads lined up who are around 140 kilos. They're 300 pounds, if not more. The acceleration isn't there. Takes a bit of time to get that diesel engine trucking. Mm -hmm. But my God, once they pass the 50 meter mark on the track, I assume this is the standard 100 meters, they are right in the race. And that maximum speed phase, they carry it through so well. The actual sprinting technique is not atrocious here. You see them, they probably come up to that full standing position a bit early. They probably get into the maximum speed phase a bit early and kind of transition out of acceleration a bit too early. It's probably due to a body mass discrepancy between what we'd see in standard sprinters versus what we see here. But this is just absolute freak show. The His top speed seems to be catching at the end. If they were doing a 200 or something, it might win... So his name is Eddie uh, Pierre Lewis. So this was, a, as a Dara said, a 100-meter sprint. We don't know much else about what's actually going on here. Uh, so he's six foot three, 335 pounds, which is about 140 kilos. And it is, this is on the score, which is a very large Instagram, but it looks at things, and this went a bit viral. There's a lot of funny comments in this, but, and this is crazy. The guy in the far side lane as well, especially when you see them getting into that kind of two-thirds of the way through the race, he's not gaining acceleration. He's certainly starting to slow down, but he is well in the race there. What is that? There's a Southern Hemisphere rugby player that does the buck thing. What's that called? Quay Cooper. Quay Cooper. It looks like the... The Quay Cooper. The sta- look, when he's kind of doing the head yeah, thing, the bob The goose bit. step. I can imagine my sprint form resembles that as well currently. <laughs> So this one takes a little bit of exposition, so bear with me. Cue dramatic music. Everyone's aware, or everyone watching this is probably aware of Jamal Browner, famed American deadlifter. Most of you are probably aware of Ivan Mark Rothstrong, someone who I think was attempting the 500 kilo deadlift at one stage and got quite close, but didn't quite make it. Very, 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 very strong guy. Both of them are super strong. Essentially what happened here, Jamal had a video up of him doing 270 for five on the deadlifts, which is... Pretty light, given that Jamal has done 500 kilos, 370 by 5 sumo deadlift. Ivan made a video saying that he, or said he made a video of him doing 370 for a set of five. And, you know, as a way, a conventional, as a way of showing that he was kind of better as a challenge. Essentially, they messaged each other and they said that, Ivan said, look, let's have a little challenge. Let's do 370 for max reps. Jamal said, you know what, fuck it, let's just do 400 kilo. And Jamal put this video up three days ago. First rep conventional, and then he finished off six more reps with sumo at 400 kilos. 400 for a set of seven, which is crazy. The switching from conventional to sumo is mental. Imagine this even the, like most people, the amount of hype you'd need for 400 kilo deadlift. And think about that. Now, a little bit of back and forth in the comments, which is probably worth reading. Ivan said, my congratulations, it was very cool. Ivan said, I'll have a response soon. Uh, they start kind of talking back and forth, talking about maybe doing strict press. Jamal was like, that's kind of ridiculous. Uh, someone, like, obviously here, the flex of doing it on the conventional compared to, to sumo was obviously, the implications are obvious. But someone had a good point that maybe they should, um, you know, all do conventional, no one use straps uh, and whatever. But long story short, they're still kind of going back and forth. It'll be interesting to see if Ivan puts up more reps at 400 kilos uh, and if he's beats him so very very interesting kind of back and forth between the two of them the one kind of disappointing thing here is this all seemed to be in good good faith bit of bit of healthy rivalry back and forth uh, in the case of Ivan Makarov you assume he's kind of getting back in training because he says I'm not in good shape now but I will be in good shape in in a short while I'll do the same follow-up and then the comments over time kind of devolve into something where maybe it's not in that good faith anymore. Well, it looks like it, from what Ivan's saying, is he, it is in good faith, or Ivan was saying that he really respects Jamal and he thinks he's the best deadlifter. That's why he picked him. Uh, in Jamal's defense, I would, you know, like, if you don't know Ivan, you'd be like, who the fuck is this? Someone calling me out kind of a, in some ways, you know? Yes. I love to see this. I absolutely adore it. This could be, this could be 
our little stop gap between the 500 kilo deadlift going to 520 seeing how many reps people can do with 400 okay here we have from malu sonita this is the heaviest raw squat of all time from females in comp well anywhere including competition i noticed the training lift so I know there's some other lifts with wraps and suits and stuff, but that doesn't really compare to this. So this is the heaviest female squat of all time, 301 kilos. This is 15.5 kilo PB for her, uh, heaviest squat. We were talking when we had Parky Young's 270. Tatiana Karshina had rumored to done 290. There was no video, so there was no way of verifying it. The heaviest competition squat is still 285, I believe, in powerlifting. But this by Mrs. Sonita is crazy. This is... No doubt adept either. Absolutely no. No, this, in terms of positions, is a phenomenal squat. This is really, really good. But I think just to, to look at this from a slightly more broader sense, this is a historically heavy lift. Yeah. A, a, a over 300 kilo back squat without a suit or, or anything like that is just... You kind of have to take a moment to realize how how much of a milestone this is. This is of the same level of the 500 kilo deadlifts we saw in the previous few years. This is, you're not going to see things like this happening too often. No. Uh, you, you really should take note of what an utter milestone this is for female powerlifting, but for powerlifting in general, uh, 301 kilos is unbelievably impressive. There's a, certainly a lot left of the tank there, maybe 310. Mm. You know, if this was a 15.5 kilo PB in itself, there's so much momentum going behind that. So it'd be crazy to see. Yeah, this is the this is the equivalent of the male 500 kilo deadlift, like someone squatting over 300 kilos raw, pair of Nike Jordans, knee sleeves and a belt. Like, that's crazy. So crazy. 301 kilos. Uh, this happened just a couple of days ago. Look, I think there's there's something to be said as well for obviously the suit and then knee sleeves versus wraps, but even just this being a walked out from a squat rack rather than it being from a monolift, whatever small difference that makes, it's everything accumulatively makes this probably the best female squat ever. Yeah, I think it does. Like, you know, I don't really care too much for competition or not competition when it comes to massive monuments like this or momentous lifts but this is crazy next we've got a 780 pound deadlift which is 354 kilos by an 18 year old this is by big man <laughs> board and west over here big man is right 800 kilos and he is deadlifting this conventional lovely deadlift such good use of his quads knees are driving so hard into the barbell and really tidy conventional deadlift I don't know, is that just a singlet or is that a suit maybe? But, ugh, what? Looking what at the it, fuck? Looking at it in his setup, it looks to be just a singlet because it doesn't have the Velcro on the straps for the back, you know? Oh, possibly, yes. So it looks like just a singlet. It is an absolutely great looking deadlift. It is yeah. pretty much perfect for a maximal deadlift. Nearly 800 pounds. I think he said this is a 13 pound PR for him. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see like obviously he has a massive squat obviously he's an incredibly strong individual but I'd love to see where this deadlifts end up if he's 18 years old now what does that look like when he's 30 you know what I love this these two comments sum up the current state of social media one comment is demonstration that we can interact with some wonderful people and we get to see the best of the best do more than ever and we get more insight to everything they do and it's fantastic and it's what the internet was was made for. The other one is some dumb cunt <coughs> which is the opposite end of the inter internet. So the first one is invalid lift, didn't lock it out, was still shaking, do it properly or don't do it at all. Oh my God. Very next comment is the current world record holder in the deadlift with the heaviest deadlift of all time Half Thor Bjornsson saying, awesome lift, young man. Keep working hard. One day you'll smash my record. Does If that doesn't sum up the internet there, I don't know what does. <laughs> it, look, <sighs> there's not a, a limit on the number of likes you have on Instagram, right? No. You can like as many comments as you want. The big worrying thing here is that initial negative comment 
has 1,733 likes. Yeah, but Taurus has 5,500. Yeah, yeah which, which does give you some some hope, some solace but, that, that the world hasn't gone mental. But there, why on Instagram is the less upvoted lift, the more negative one at the top comment? Because it knows what's more negative and get people's attention. I'm telling you, I'm convinced. AI can definitely detect dumb cunt comments and puts them to the top half door should be at the top it's the by far the most oh there's another one upvoted there's 11,000 that's not at the top why is the dumber one at the top there tell yeah. me why I think it's at the tell top me why, I think oh my god I think it's at the top because there's more replies and more oh possibly Actually, more panache in those replies that. but if that doesn't sum up the internet I don't know what does I think you broke my knee good but <laughs> half door commenting that must be f- that must be so nice for him surely yeah. surely great lift Okay, finishing off with another great lift, we've got Lugo Ovoy squatting 455 kilos in competition. We've had Lugo on the show before. What this 455 is, uh, it's so nice. It's one of the nicest super heavy squats you'll see, I think. Lou's positions are really good, but the one thing that stands out with his squat every time I see it, particularly at the heavier weights, is how controlled they are. Mm. He doesn't dive bomb the bottom position, particularly when you're wearing knee wraps like that. They're very tight. You'll get a lot of that kind of reflex or that rebound out of them. In his case, it's so controlled on the way down, it almost looks like a tempo squat. No loss of position, no crazy bounce, no kind of big uh, whipping of the bar or anything like that. It is very, very good. I think if you're a powerlifter, particularly a powerlifter who is maybe in the heavier weight classes, you're a bit bigger, I think this is the kind of model you could be looking at for your squat. Not really dive bombing, not particularly during your your preparatory phases, during some of the higher volume stuff, just having a bit more control, training yourself to lift like this. I think you'll have better outcomes in the long run. Yeah, you can see him going to open his knees. Usually that's referred for people or reserved for people with larger hips, a bit more mass in the ass, as it were, so to kind of sit in between. So it's not always possible to hit that comp depth by just driving your knees forward. And if you're trying not to bottom out, you need to kind of make that happen. So he's tracking those knees over the toes. But the funny thing is, like Ram 4s, while being a terrible shoe, look really cool. They're a good-looking shoe. Like, they're... A trendy looking shoe, you know. Do you know what I'd say? It's they're a quite athletic looking shoe. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of our weightlifting shoes were not blessed with the best looking shoe. Certainly not a shoe that makes you look like you could do a sprint afterwards. Yeah. But the Nike Ram Fours are very sleek. That's the problem, is they went for people who want to do running too. Thanks for watching the Seek Strength News Show. I don't know why we keep being like, let's make today's not as long, but today's again is nearly an hour. So thanks for watching. Check out Seek a Strength app on iOS or Android. If you need a good night's sleep, if you're sleep sleeping great, check out Seek a Sleep on seekastrength.com. Why does it help your sleep? Because it contains some of the most important micronutrients you need. No sleep promoting sedatives, no hormonal agents, just micronutrients that are very important for your sleep in Seek a Sleep. So check that out. Get on subscription or once off. Thank you to everyone who sends stuff in on the new show. The new show tag or the Instagram tagging system currently isn't working for some reason. So please DM us. I went through about a million DMs this morning to start out the new show. So thank you so much for everyone who DMs us. Keep DMing us as far as I can see. The tagging system is still broken. So please do keep DMing us. You make the new show so much better. And we're into our second calendar year, which is crazy. This must be like episode 70 of the new show. So no time, no no stopping in the future. Can't stop, won't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. But we need to stop making them so long, do we?